G'day. Today we're doing my favourite thing, designing a standalone power system. We're looking at the formulas for calculating the amount of PV and the amount of battery storage, whether it's off-grid or hybrid. Okay, let's get into it. Welcome everyone to episode nine of this series of solar and battery training. Um, today we're going to be focusing on selecting and sizing a solar um, and battery system. Uh, just the basic principles around particularly the mathematics uh, and understanding load profiles. But we've got a bit of housekeeping to start with and um, here we all are uh, self-isolating in different parts of the world. Um, I'm here with my colleague Rachel. Um, we're home with our kids at the moment. So, say hi Rachel. Hello everyone. Um, I just want to remind you that uh, questions are in the Q&A window and please keep them coming. They're much easier. It's much easier to get them all answered if you ask them as you think them. And conversations between yourselves can go in the chat window and um, you can, if you miss a webinar, you can go and see it on the Smart Energy Lab YouTube channel, which is Glenn's YouTube channel, Smart Energy Lab. And if you have any curly questions that you don't feel have been answered here, you can ask them there as well in the comments. Thanks, Rachel. Um, yeah, so uh, today we'll, we'll jump straight into uh, what I call selecting and sizing specific loads, uh, selecting and sizing a system for specific loads. The, the reason I'm starting with loads is actually any system um, that you are designing with solar and batteries, it's about the loads. It's not about the, 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 the number of panels you have or the size of your battery because there's an objective in a design which is to, to meet the load energy and power requirements. And I have to say this is the hardest part is to find out what the loads are. Um, you know, for those of you who have uh, been through this process as designers or installers, customers often just say things like, how much is a hybrid system? How much is a standalone power system? Uh, I'm going off grid. How much is it going to cost me? They don't give you any information often. And so eliciting that information so that you can do a design, a compliant design, is really important. So let's just jump into my um, presentation to have a, a quick overview of how this works. For those who haven't been to my webinars before, these presentations are, um, are shared via my YouTube channel. So you'll find them on the channel um, later tonight. And uh, there will also be some follow-up questions. I often answer them in the description field or in the comments below. So my channel, um, Rachel will type that in the bottom and the caption so you can see what the channel is. So that's where I live. Um, I've been introducing each day with a nice picture of uh, the Smart Energy Lab, which is also an off-grid community uh, just near Melbourne on Mount Tilibawong. That's where I do a lot of my training and testing of products. So selecting and sizing specific loads. Uh, getting the information, like I said, is, is often the hardest part. Finding uh, what the customer wants uh, your system build design uh, to achieve. Now, there's a kind of fundamental differentiation. If you're on-grid, and you want solar and battery storage, there are many reasons for that. One of them might be just to self-use your solar energy and not export it to the grid. So in a way, there is no right size. A, a tiny system can be a, a self-use system. A large system can be a self-use system. Uh, but once you go to an off-grid system or a system that is required to have backup of the grid, then you do need to know what the loads are. So this is the steps that we're going to, um, to look at, uh, how we find out what the customer load energy requirements are. We also need to know what their maximum power demand is. Now those two words, energy and power, use units that look very similar. Energy is kilowatt hours in this examples that I'll use because it's, it's work done, whereas power is instantaneous potential. So when you turn on a toaster, it uses power to, to, to heat up but the longer you leave it on, the more energy it consumes. So those are two factors that we have to calculate. We're going to focus today mostly on energy, uh, understanding the energy requirements of a system, because that's what a battery stores, and that's what a solar PV system generates over time. We also have to look at what period of autonomy. That means, for instance, if you're on grid and you have a blackout, how long can you run for without the grid? 
And if you're off-grid, how long can you run for without um, a backup power source like a generator or even just the lights going out? So days of autonomy is usually the terminology for off-grid. Um, and also looking at the balance between direct consumed renewable energy from your PV system uh, directly to the loads versus energy that's coming out of a battery. And uh, we'll finally, um, uh, inverter power ratings, understanding why we need to be um, uh, aware of what maximum demand is so we have an inverter that can deliver that power and uh, the different reasons that um, someone might have a battery and solar system on grid. There's reasons such as I mentioned, self-use of solar, um, it might be because they have a, a maximum demand tariff, they're a commercial customer and they want to lock those peaks, or they might be worried about blackouts and they want backup. So those are some of the reasons. Comments about um, loads, smart meters for kilowatt hour average usage, and um, but unfortunately that doesn't provide peak power. Yeah, so... Um, if you live in a uh, part of uh, the world where you have what's often called a smart meter, uh, a meter that measures uh, energy in real time and aggregates that into intervals, uh, typically that's a, a 30 minute interval, those that aggregated readings are uh, used to bill you. Now, uh, depending where you are, those that data can be um, accessible to the customer, uh, usually with privacy um, requirements, so it's, it's private data. But that's extremely useful if you're trying to size a system on grid because you've got that load profile. You, you know when they use the energy and how much they use. It's not as useful as finding out what their maximum demand is. Like if you turn on a large appliance and turn it straight off again, um, you haven't used much energy, so it won't appear as a lot of energy in that half-hour interval data, but it's a big peak. And that's where data loggers come in. So Fabio points out, um, yeah, a data logger is pretty essential to calculate um, surge demand and maximum power. Um, data loggers can be simple temporary tools, um, can be clipped onto conductors to measure current, or they can be set to record over time and capture you know, um, a period, um, and they can capture it at small or large intervals. So what I want to um, bring up now is a little pre-prepared um, uh, uh, drawings that I've done to explain this process. So, okay, so system sizing. Um, this is just a, a, a little sketch that I've done um, beforehand to uh, really dumb down what is a standard for designing a standalone system. Now, uh, ASNZS 4509 Part 2 is the design standard for standalone power systems. Um, what I've done is taken Appendix A, which has got 16 pages of formulas in it, and uh, dumbed it down to six easy steps. Now, you might think, well, hang on, Glenn, if you dumb it down, is it, is it any use? Well, actually, yes, because it it's, um, was written long ago when the price of solar panels was very high. System sizes were often quite small. And uh, oversizing the solar wasn't really economically viable. So people wanted very precise, or designers wanted very precise designs. So it's sort of engineering grade design um, methodology. Um, I've kind of dumbed it down just to the basic principles on how to size a system. So it all starts with, and it's six easy steps with A. Now A is the hardest part. As I said before, Calculating the customer's load energy requires actually finding stuff out. Now, it's unlikely if it's a, a new build, such as an off-grid system, that you actually have any data at all. They'll, they'll just say, we're building a you know, three or four bedroom home. Um, but you'll need them to fill out a load sheet. A load sheet really is just a simple document with a list of appliances, uh, their power ratings, their operation per day, hours per day, and you can use that to come up with an energy target for uh, that load or those loads. Um, that is also, in a, in a way, your legal protection. You are designing a system for a specific purpose. Um, if they don't give you the information, and, it, and uh, you know, then you can't do it with any confidence. So if, it, uh, if you ever get into some legal dispute, you can say, well, this is what you provided me with. This is what I designed the system for. I didn't design it for another house to be built in the back garden. So uh, getting this is both useful from a design point of view, but also very important from uh, a legal protection. How do you get this information? Um, well, various ways. Uh, getting the customer to actually um, provide you with a list of appliances and expected use times. Um, 
things like lighting, for instance, I often suggest that they talk about uh, how many lights per room or even just do a load sheet based on rooms, like what's in your lounge, what's going to be in your kitchen, what's going to be uh, in your garage, etc. cetera, um, and build a load profile around that. So this uh, highly technical document, which is just a word file <laughs> with a list of appliances is often all I use. Uh, doesn't have to be that sophisticated. Um, maybe you prefer to use a spreadsheet and fill out a spreadsheet, but have a list of typical appliances and some gaps for people to fill them out. You might want to break this up into rows where um, header rows are rooms. So you have a, a header row for you know the, the lounge and then the list of appliances. The quantity of those appliances, their power ratings, their daily usage in hours, and you can calculate from that by multiplying quantity times power times hours into what our uh, energy uh, requirements for those loads. So that simple load sheet, um, often I just send this to an acquirer. So if a customer says, how much is our system? I go, well, I'll give them some ballpark figures. And then if they're still interested, because it's useful to give people an idea that off-grid is not as cheap as on-grid because you're actually providing all the power with, an, with some autonomy. Um, so I often send them the sheet and get them to start filling this out. So I've used a typical, well, quite efficient home here. So I shouldn't say typical, uh, 10 kilowatt hours of daily energy use as, as a worked example. So I'm gonna run through a worked example. Remember these slides will be available uh, on, on my um, YouTube site uh, through my channel, um, Smart Energy Lab. So the 10 kilowatt hours, I always say that the biggest cost savings in a off-grid design is reducing the load energy. It's not putting in more solar or less batteries. It's reducing the load energy. Uh, uh, the best watts you can use are the watts you never needed. Uh, so trimming down a system by uh, choosing more efficient appliances, uh, and trying to move people from appliances which are uh, not suitable for off-grid and finding other sources, for instance, using a resistive element hot water service is probably not a great idea. They might want to look at a heat pump or solar PV or solar water or thermal water heating system. Um, if they're trying to heat, uh, uh, you wouldn't want to use resistive heating, probably want to use uh, compressive reverse cycle heating systems uh, or other energy sources. So step one usually in a standalone power system design is to look at the energy resources available to the customer. Um, do they have uh, a source of energy from wind, water, sun, wood, um, <laughs> or other? So uh, those are the energy sources that you can use in a design. Personally, I live in a cold climate um, in, a, in a forested area. We have a lot of trees. So we use wood for our predominant source of heating. And that takes a big load off our electrical system. Um, B is actually, um, seems kind of trivial, but just selecting a battery system voltage. Now it's partly to do with the mathematics. Uh, we need to know what the battery system voltage is to calculate, um, uh, amp hour capacities, et cetera, of batteries, but it also determines in a way the capability of your, um, inverter that you connect to it. For instance, if you've got a 12 volt system, um, a 12 volt inverter, uh, you won't be able to supply very large loads because at 12 volts, the current draw from a battery gets to be insanely high very quickly. We're talking hundreds, if not thousands of amps uh, to deliver, you know, 10 kilowatts of power. Whereas as you move up the battery voltage level, say to 48 volts, um, then your currents reduce to a quarter of what they would be at 12. If you move up to say a 120 volt system, uh, they, they proportionally um, currents reduce again. So managing current actually is part of it. But the other one is what products are available. If you're looking at 12 volts, um, generally products aimed at the um, very low end of the market, recreational vehicle, camping, there are some quality 12 volt inverters, but they generally are um, few. You move up to 24, there's a better choice and better power ratings. You get to 48 volts, nominal battery systems, and there's a huge range of off-grid and even hybrid and system, inverter systems in the 48 volt range. When you go above 48 volts, it gets a bit thinner again. There's fewer products available. Um, they tend to be more of a niche product, but they do give you much higher power levels. So in this case, we've chosen a, um, I'm, I'm designing a lithium ion battery system in this worked example, and its nominal voltage is 52 volts, not 48. So 
Now we're moving on to um, understanding the losses in a system. Now, it's all very well to know that the customer needs 10 kilowatt hours per day of, um, of energy to run their loads, but you actually have to have more than that stored in a battery um, because of your load losses. And that's losses such as um, your wiring system, your round trip efficiency of your battery, your inverters conversion efficiencies, and, and there's some subtle other ones, but those are the three main ones. For instance, um, different battery chemistries have different efficiencies. You might find that a, a lead acid battery system is around 85 to 90% round trip efficiency. So of the energy you put into it, you can draw back about 85 to 90% of that. But that's only when it's brand new. And as it ages, that round trip efficiency diminishes. Um, other chemistries might have um, higher or lower round trip efficiencies. In this case, I'm using lithium, which have pretty high round trip efficiencies in the 90s. Um, the wiring losses, uh, I call them self-inflicted because you choose the cables, you choose the losses. Basically, the size of your cable determines what the losses will be. And there are regulatory requirements around this in Australia and New Zealand, uh, what the maximum voltage drop is between a um, generating source or a source of supply and the most remote part of a load circuit. So that's a maximum of 5%. Um, in a PV array, um, we also have losses. Um, we'll get onto that in a second, but that's a, um, a should, not a shall in terms of what that uh, maximum loss is. The inverter itself has a job to do. It's gonna take DC power and convert it to AC power. And in doing that, there is some um, heat generated and that's loss. And battery inverters generally are lossier than uh, solar grid connected inverters. And the reason for that is they have a tougher job to do. Often they're lifting up from a low voltage, so extra low voltage, such as 48 volts, up to 230 volts AC. So they've got a, a bigger voltage transformation to deal with. But the other problem is that they generally are running at relatively low loads most of the time. Um, so if you have a, a five kilowatt battery inverter, it won't be running, hopefully, at five kilowatts all day long. Um, you'd, you'd have a very inefficient house if you did. So they're running at relatively low loads. Um, many residential homes have a, a base load when no one's doing anything of only about three or 400 watts. So the inverter is supplying only a small amount of power, but its own internal electronics requires power to run. And so what's called parasitic losses become a more significant component of the energy consumed. So at low loads, efficiency is often poorer. Uh, whereas a solar inverter um, is trying to you know, run at full power during the middle of the day when it's sunny, and so it's running at higher power levels more often, and efficiency is much better at those high power levels because parasitic losses are small. So you need to find from the manufacturer what those efficiencies are and, uh, and put them in there. Now, it, it's factors for efficiency are what we're interested in here. So you'll notice that I haven't put a percentage figure. Uh, for instance, a round trip efficiency of a battery might be 95%. Its factor for efficiency is 0.95. Because remember, percentage is just a, a clever way of writing a factor, you know, 95 divided by 100. Uh, so that's our factor for efficiency for a battery. Wiring, often we talk about wiring losses, not wiring efficiency, but it's just the reciprocal. So if we're losing 5% of our energy in our wiring system, our factor for efficiency is 0.95. One being no loss, 0.95 being 5% loss. And in the case of the inverter, it's 92% efficient from the manufacturer's data sheet. So we've put in a factor for 0.93. Now you multiply those factors together to get uh, an aggregate. And that's 0.83 is the overall subsystem uh, efficiency factor. So that means that, you know, really 17% of the energy that we have is lost before it gets to the loads. It's just an unavoidable fact. Uh, yeah, Jeremy asks, is there a way of finding out the parasitic losses of an inverter? if it's not on the spec sheet. The, the parasitic losses uh, can be measured very simply with a clamp meter, a DC clamp meter on um, one of the conductors from the battery. So for instance, you turn the inverter on, but turn off the output um, uh, main switch for that, that inverter. So it's actually got nothing connected to it. It's on and doing nothing. And the amount of current that you're drawing from the battery is the parasitic loss. So current times voltage, if you know what the battery voltage is, let's say it's 52 volts and you're drawing one amp, therefore your parasitic losses are 52 watts. Uh, so as a factor or fraction of um, power consumption, at that point, it's 100% loss. 
So as soon as you turn on some loads, um, that factor will still be the same. It'll still be 52%. But there are some inverters that have a clever strategy to reduce parasitic losses. Um, they're not that practical these days because of fridges. <laughs> I'll explain. Um, some uh, off-grid inverters have a feature known as standby mode, which means they don't power up fully. They just pulse every half to one second, a small pulse of output. So they pulse, say, 230 volts every second or so, and they're trying to detect if any loads are turned on. And so if they see a low impedance, they think, oh, someone switched something on, and now we'll power up fully. So doing that, they can reduce their parasitic losses uh, tremendously because they're only doing a blip every second or so, not constantly on. But the problem with that is that as soon as you have an appliance that draws you know, more than about 20, 30 watts or so all the time, uh, such as you know, a fridge, for instance, a fridge doesn't want to be uh, blipped on and off, it will keep the inverter running all the time. So if you do have loads that you can actually turn off fully at the, at the wall switch, then uh, a standby feature of an inverter is a very effective way of reducing um, parasitic losses. Okay, uh, what we're looking at here is the, the steps to doing a design in order of the process. So we've calculated our load energy, we've selected our battery system voltage, we've calculated our load subsystem efficiency factors, and just to remind you that some of those factors you can um, manipulate, such as wiring losses. I, I often say one of the cheapest ways of um, re reducing the losses in a system is actually oversizing your cables. So, you know, you might be trying to choose a cable just to do big enough to do the job, but actually going up one size can actually have an efficiency factor improvement. So if you gain 1% by increasing the cable size on your batteries, for instance, in terms of your efficiency of your system, that's 1% for the rest of its life. It's not just a momentary benefit. Uh, if you try to get an inverter that's 1% more efficient, you might find that you've gone up a lot in cost. So it's actually, actually a relatively cheap way of improving efficiency uh, uh, to some extent. Now we need to know what the, the daily um, load uh, energy demand is from the battery system. So we know what the customer's loads are, but how much is coming out of the battery? Very simple equation here. Basically, we just um, take A, our customer's load energy, divide it by our subsystem load efficiency factor, and that will give us how much we're drawing out of the battery. So just dwell on that for a second. Um, if you've got uh, 10 kilowatts of load, you need more than 10 kilowatts of storage to be able to deliver that 10 kilowatts to our, sorry, 10 kilowatt hours to the load um, in, uh, over a, a day without any generation running. So say for instance, uh, overcast day or nighttime. Um, so here we, we actually need 12 kilowatt hours of energy stored in our battery to deliver that 10 kilowatt hours to the customer's loads. All right, so this probably is the most technical part, and I will kind of branch out, branch out in a second to sort of explain it in more detail. But how do you size a PV array to meet the load energy requirements? So you need to generate as much as the system requires from the battery, so that we need to be able to put in 12 kilowatt hours uh, into that battery, but we have losses uh, in the PV array itself. Um, so Paul just answered, asked a question there, I just noticed it popped up um, about what battery technology has less losses. Uh, <laughs> well, um, I suppose a supercapacitor has the lowest losses because it's really just a charge storage device. Uh, lithium ion batteries have very small loss, uh, uh, but then if at the low end of the spectrum, your nickel ion batteries are quite inefficient when cycled. Um, so, yeah, and, and some of them, their losses depend on how they're used. Uh, some batteries have um, a certain amount of um, self-use when they're in standby, but less when they're being operated. So, yeah, this is a product-specific question. So let's look at how we calculate the PV array size. Um, D is the, the daily kilowatt hour demand, and we're dividing it by peak sun hours. Now, I have introduced this term before, peak sun hours. What is peak sun hours? It's actually not an SI unit. It's uh, industry shorthand for kilowatt hours per square meter um, of solar radiation. Now, the sun falls. So typically, we'll get um, solar production on a sunny day that looks like a bell curve. It peaks around solar noon. So this would be here, uh, solar noon, which is not the same as clock noon. It's when the sun's at its highest point. Or 
if it's a um, uh, equator facing array, the peak really is when the, the sun is perpendicular to the panel. So if you had an east facing array, uh, that peak would be uh, more in the morning. And if you had a west facing array, that peak would be in the afternoon. But we're looking at an equator facing array here. And uh, that, that uh, is a certain amount of power from the sun. So let's say we're getting uh, at the middle of the day approximately a thousand watts per square meter of solar radiation. So this is solar radiation here. And it's not a maximum, it's a, um, I think we covered this in episode one or two of the series. Um, it's a typical peak on a clear sunny day. So that peak there um, is an instantaneous amount of, of power. But energy is the area under the curve, this whole area here. And so it's represented in uh, watt hours per square meter, or more commonly in kilowatt hours or megajoules per square meter. So it's a bit like um, a peak sun hours is a way of saying the sun turned on at a thousand watts, ran for a few hours and then turned off again. So the red area, um, so the red area uh, equals the yellow area, the area under the curve. And in this case, that might be, um, you know, four uh, kilowatt hours per square meter of solar radiation. Now, that's a bit of a mouthful to say. So in the industry, we talk about peak sun hours as a shorthand or even better PSH. So they're the same thing. Kilowatt hours per square meter uh, is the same as peak sun hours. How are we going on the question front, Rachel? Uh, Jeffrey asks, what about DOD? Uh, so DOD, depth of discharge, um, so, so the, I think we'll cover this when we look at the sizing of the battery, so I'll come sure to that he, in a minute. Sorry, I'm not sure he was asking. I think he may know the definition, I, I suspect, but I just, um, I'm, it may have been in relate, relation to you. It's something you were talking about before, sorry. But, yeah, it will come, Jeffrey. Uh, Richard, I was, I was typing a response to Richard, but I may as well ask um, out loud. Is the time that loads are used significant to off-grid design, e.g. used during peak sun hours, or is this only relevant to grid connected? Right, I, okay, well, once again, a, a, a good question and a common one that I get. Uh, so I'll hear people say, well, what about if it's a sunny day, I don't need to use my batteries, the energy is coming straight from the sun going into my loads, so does that mean I don't need so much batteries? Well, the principles of 4509 uh, that you need in a standalone power system, an off-grid system, uh, that you need to be able to cover the load energy requirements irrespective of any solar input because solar is unpredictable and can't be guaranteed. But it is a very conservative design um, philosophy. I say it's been designed as if um, you have to survive a total eclipse for a number of days. <laughs> because we know that even on an overcast day, there is some um, solar input. And that's kind of a shortcoming of the of 4509 is it doesn't acknowledge that oversizing of a PV array can help reduce uh, daytime um, use of batteries to almost nothing. So let's say um, you've got a, a you know, fairly heavy rainy day will be about 5%. If you s sized your PV system 20 times bigger than you need, you will, you'll still be able to run um, completely off solar uh, without using your batteries during the day. But that's a bit ridiculous. But even just doubling it has a significant benefit. So doubling the amount of PV that you actually need will significantly reduce the demand on the battery, even on overcast days. But like I said, this, this design principle is based on no renewable input. And uh, so it's the worst case scenario. It, you know, let's just say it's not quite a total eclipse, but it's just terrible Melbourne weather for you know, three or four days. Um, and we're gonna be running battery uh, from our battery system day and night. Okay, so- um, Oh, Glenn, sorry, Jeffrey yep. clarified. He thought DOD um, should have been in section D of the design steps. Uh, it's coming up. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that section, DOD in a minute. All right, so calculating the PV size, we need to consider um, the amount of solar resource, and that's what peak sun hours represent, the, the, the resource of solar uh, on our surface. And that will help us determine how much power a, a given PV size will produce, sorry, how much energy a given PV size will produce uh, based on that solar resource. But we're gonna lose some of that um, that energy due to what I call PV subsystem efficiency factors. 
Uh, it's not just one thing. It's not just the, and it's certainly not the efficiency of the panel. A panel has a cell efficiency, which is how much of its, um, the, the, the energy from the sun actually is converted to electricity. Uh, we're not concerned with that at all. So it doesn't matter if your panels are 1% efficient or 100% efficient. Uh, uh, when they say it's a 100 watt panel, it's a 100 watt panel. The only difference is it'll be very big if it's 1% efficient. To produce 100 watts, uh, it'll have to be a lot bigger uh, uh, than, than a more efficient um, solar panel. So I, I'm just pointing out that cell efficiency or module level efficiency is really about area efficiency, how efficiently it can use a certain area of roof. It doesn't actually make any more power. A 300 watt module is a 300 watt module, whether it's 7% efficient or 20% efficient, it's still a 300 watt module. It's just a different size. Um, the factors I am looking at are um, things like, um, sorry, I haven't got to that there, uh, things like uh, the losses due to thermal. Now, this is where I do have a slide further up here. I'll just go to it. Here we go. Thermal losses of a PV panel. So a PV panel is rated at a standard test conditions. That means 25 degrees cell temperature. The cells on the panels are at 25 degrees Celsius, 1,000 watts per square meter of solar radiation, and an air mass of 1.5, which is really the spectral characteristic of the light, sort of roughly, you know, uh, mid-morning, mid-afternoon light. Uh, that's what the power rating of a panel is. So when they say it's a 300 watt panel, it's only under those conditions. So we have to calculate the real power from that panel in real operating conditions. And so this is known as the power temperature coefficient. As the panels warm up, they'll start to lose power. And so um, the, t the temperature coefficient is a negative coefficient. That means as you increase temperature, you lose power. So on a sunny day, the cells get quite warm. Um, you know, if, even if the ambient temperature um, is around the 20 degree mark or 30 degree mark, you might find the panels are up around 60 degrees, the cells on the panel. And the measure that it's the back of the panel, closest you can get to the cell is the back. So here we're giving an example is if the cells are at 60 degrees Celsius on a sunny day, what is their true output? This is a 300 watt panel, but remember it's only 300 watts at 25 degrees cell temperature. We're raising that 35 degrees above test conditions. So we've increased its operating temperature by 35 degrees from test conditions. And we just multiply the temperature coefficient. That, that's provided by in the data sheet for the panel. It tells you how much power you're losing as a percentage for every degree of change. So it's a negative coefficient. So in this case, our 300 watt panel on a sunny day is actually a 260 watt panel. Now, this is one of the main kind of complaints that customers often have is that their system isn't producing what they thought it would. They thought they bought a five kilowatt PV system, but it's only putting out four and a bit. It's because it's sunny, the panels have warmed up. There's nothing wrong with that. Possibly the problem is we shouldn't be selling systems based on peak watts. We should be selling them based on the savings they give the customer or, or the utility they give the customer. Um, just the peak watts is just a, a, a momentary thing. So it is possible in very cold climates, by the way, to go in the other direction. So if you, you know, typically a cell will be about 25 to 35 degrees warmer than the ambient temperature in full sun. And uh, if you're in somewhere that's like minus five degrees, I think we had someone who was at, um, in the coldest part of New Zealand than <laughs> basically saying, you know, it got down to minus 15 or so, uh, you would actually get more than 300 watts out of your panels. So, yep, if you live in a really cold place, there is a little boost to this um, performance. Okay, so do we have some, some questions here? A couple, oh, three so far. Okay, Fabio asks, should we size the array considering the energy required to fully charge the batteries in a day and the average energy, requ energy required by the load while recharging the batteries? So the, in, in um, the design standard 4509 part two, the purpose of days of autonomy is partly so that you can operate without renewable input, but it also indicates that you can recharge over a period of days. You don't have to recharge in one day. So if you've got, um, you start to average out, that's the whole purpose of days of autonomy. You start to average out the good days and the bad days. So um, it's, a, it's a good principle for an off-grid system to have you know, a reasonable number of days of autonomy. Um, the recommendation in 4509 is um, without auto start generator 
auto start backup generator five days of autonomy. With an auto start backup generator, you can drop it down to maybe two days of autonomy. It just means you'll be running the generator more often. With five days of autonomy, um, you'll average out quite a lot of the weather cycles. So you'll go through um, inclement weather and good weather. And so recharge might occur over several days. You don't fully ca catch up in one day. But like I said before, um, with the oversizing um, of uh, PV systems, it is possible to design a system that is always capturing, uh, or ca almost always catching up in one day. And that does help reduce um, the battery size. Okay, next question. Uh, how significant, Mark asks, how significant are the NOCT power figures provided on the data sheet of some solar panels? Um, frankly, I don't actually use NOCT myself when I'm designing um, so nominal operating um, cell temperature. So these are kind of like um, uh, not using standard test conditions. They're a different set of conditions, NOCT. Um, the lower solar radiation figure, generally 800 watts per square meter, um, a, a different um, uh, cell temperature, etc. Uh, it, it's more significant um, from a design, a manufacturing's point of view in terms of the quality of their panels, um, what the NOCT figure is compared to their STC. Uh, can I just slide that one under the mat and say, don't worry about it, Mark? Okay, Richard asks, what is the typical temperature rise of a module, e.g. at zero degrees? Does it rise to 25 degrees at the module? So there's some industry rules of thumb and, uh, you know, rules of thumb are questionable at the best of times, but in this case, they, I've done some testing myself and these rules of thumbs are quite accurate. Um, I've got a, a test system on the roof of my house with um, thermocouples on the back of the panels, uh, ambient temperature sensors, uh, solar radiation, um, uh, pyranometer, uh, you know, uh, uh, really high quality one. And so I've measured the temperature rise over a range of conditions. Um, I would suggest that, and I've got some panels that are parallel to the roof and some that are on a tilt frame. So they're sort of freestanding and they pick up a good bit of air movement. Uh, I probably should write this down because this is kind of an important part of that um, calculation. The rule of thumb is that if we have a uh, flat mounted panels. So flat means horizontal, flat or horizontal. We will get about 35 degrees um, rise. So ambient, whoops, we'll get uh, ambient plus 35 degrees Celsius. So they run really hot. So putting your panels um, perfectly flat will make them really quite hot. If they're parallel to an inclined roof, they'll get a little bit of passive cooling by convection. Uh, so parallel to roof. And so now we've got ambient plus 30 degrees Celsius. And sorry for those who are Fahrenheit people, I, I don't speak Fahrenheit. Um, and if we've got freestanding or on a inclined tilt frame, so they're getting picking up any air movement, uh, so freestanding will be the best option. Uh, we'll get ambient plus 25 degrees Celsius. There you go. So those rules of thumb I've monitored, well, I actually haven't done um, horizontal, but I've certainly done parallel and freestanding. Uh, they do appear to be pretty accurate. Uh, they vary throughout the day, of course. Early in the morning, the difference is small. In the middle of the day, it's, it's larger, but on average, it's around these figures. So it's pretty useful from a design point of view. Peter Green asks, um, because European principles use a different calculation, how should the cell temperature be chosen for calculating max VOC? Equivalent to minimum monthly temp or minimum monthly temp plus some allowance for cell temp increase due to a radiation that turns the cell on? Okay, so um, Peter, uh, I guess I'm focusing on Australian standards here. So in Australia and New Zealand, so the joint standards, uh, VOC maximum is a regulatory um, figure that you need to calculate. So you cannot install a system uh, on a domestic residence that has a maximum VOC over 600 volts. So that's open circuit voltage of the PV array. And that needs to be calculated based on a temperature compensation. So not just the nameplate rating of the panel. If it says on the back of the panel, it's uh, you know 39 volts VOC. That's at standard test conditions. We need to calculate it at the coldest operating temperature. So that's what our standard says. 
Um, in um, 5033, our, our PV array standard actually gives you a table that you can choose to use, kind of like a cheat sheet. So it gives you five degree increments that you can choose what the multiplier is. Uh, or you can calculate it from the manufacturer's data sheet uh, or if the manufacturer actually gives you the VOC at a certain temperature. So we, um, it's, it's not based on uh, other countries' principles, it's based on uh, our standards. What is the number of recharge days you recommend? Uh, yeah, well, so the standard says, like I said, um, 4509 recommends five days if you've got no auto start backup generator, two days if you have an auto start backup generator. I'm seeing a move away from that, actually. Um, I'm seeing people actually reducing their days of autonomy by compensating, by oversizing PV, even to the point where they choose to have no generator. Now, this is where you're kind of flying a little bit risky. Um, chances are you could run out of power. So if your system um, doesn't have any form of backup, whether it's manual or automatic, uh, you, the, the customer needs to be aware that they can actually uh, go black, so their system shuts down. And in some designs, going black, shutting down, is a big problem because uh, in, a, in a many AC-coupled systems, you actually need the inverter to stay on for solar to recharge during the day, whereas a DC-coupled system, as we covered earlier in episodes uh, three and four, uh, not such a problem. But um, yeah, oversizing of PV array can really reduce your, your days of autonomy, and this is something you would discuss with the customer. All right, so we were up to... Um, there we go, calculating the size of the system. Now, um, note that I've put in a peak sign hours of 4.5. Now, where did I get that figure from? This is kind of where it gets a bit hard. Getting solar radiation data uh, is often um, the more challenging part of the design. Um, there is some free sources of data. So here in uh, Australia, we have the Bureau of Meteorology in New Zealand, uh, NIWA. There are global sites run from places like NASA, and there are commercial companies who offer this data as well. Uh, so many of the free sites actually only provide you with horizontal data. That means for panels that are perfectly flat. Some of them provide you with equator facing panels at um, optimal angles for that latitude. Uh, but what you need for a design where it's none of those things, the house could be facing any particular direction at any particular roof inclination, uh, you need to be able to calculate it for all those variables. Uh, so that's something where software really comes in. Um, this is a bit of a segue to tomorrow, which is we'll be looking at using Solar Plus, the, the software that uh, uh, that um, my company produces. Um, Rachel will be running us through that design process tomorrow using Solar Plus. But um, if you do have access to solar radiation data, you need to um, choose it for an off-grid system based on a monthly average of the worst month of the year. So you don't just use annual averages for off-grid. They're meaningless because you can't store the surplus energy from summer and use it in winter. Uh, you can really only store a few days worth of energy. So you need to look at what's known as the load resource ratio. What's the worst ratio between the solar resource and the customer's load energy requirements? And that becomes your design month. And that becomes the peak sun hours for that particular um, surface that you're planning on installing the solar on, the solar panels on. And in this case, it's a pretty ambitious figure, 4.5 peaks on hours. Um, it depends what, um, what my solar resource is for this site and what month I've chosen. But uh, when I say ambitious, I've probably chosen a fairly sunny part of Australia, like Queensland. Um, uh, and uh, I'm using this figure, this peak sun hours is not a maximum. Um, it's, it's not necessarily a minimum. It's just that month when it's most difficult to meet the loads. I'm also factoring in all the losses associated with this, which is um, the losses in the PV subsystem. Now, I've put a whole bunch of numbers in there, which um, represent things like the thermal losses, the wiring losses, the conversion losses of your charge controller or inverter, and the AC losses on the output of an inverter. So once we do that sum, divide those through, we work out for this particular location, the customer needs 10 kilowatt hours per day, we need uh, 3.5 kilowatt hours, sorry, kilowatts peak. And the little P means nameplate rating. They're not real watts, remember, they're just nameplate rating watts. We need 3.5 kilowatts of solar panels to achieve um, a replacement of that energy and recharge of those batteries. So getting lastly to um, the batteries. Now, I just saw a few more questions flow down there that might relate how to calculate for bifacial panels. Um, Aiden. Uh, <laughs> that's a really tough one because uh, we, the, the amount of um, 
of albedo, the reflection off the earth or the surfaces behind a panel are highly variable depending on what the surface is. Um, probably the only way is to actually do it and to find out what the benefit is. There are, you'll find some manufacturers will give you a range, you know, for certain types of surfaces like dry grass, sand, white roof, they'll give you a, an indication of what that um, benefit of bifacial is. But it is a tough one. Um, I'm actually in the process of putting a solar tracking system in here at the Smart Energy Lab, which will have bifacial panels comparing with uh, monofacial panels, and it will be on a open field grassy site. So I will get some data that I'll be able to share live online. Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll be able to speak more knowledge about, more knowledgeably about that. But let me just finish on this slide, which is calculating battery size, and then I'll answer there's a whole suite of questions that I'll, I'll come to so the last step is how do you size a battery system now remember this is based on the principle of 4509 which is uh, total eclipse <laughs> there's no renewable input we need to choose the numbers of days of autonomy in our design um, as a salesperson, often this is where you can have a little bit of wiggle room, um, perhaps starting with what's ideal. Let's say we go for five days of autonomy and the customer books at the price of your system. Well, for an off-grid system, batteries are often the main cost of a, an off-grid system um, or major cost part of an off-grid system. So if you reduce the days of autonomy, you reduce the size of the battery system and you reduce the cost. But the consequences to the customer are they may fall short on renewables in, in poor weather conditions and may have to use a backup generator more often. But that is a valid choice, um, balancing non-renewables uh, with renewables. The D is, remember, the uh, amount of, um, uh, of um, uh, energy demand from the battery system, days of autonomy, and then we divide that by the maximum depth of discharge. So the question came up earlier, what about DOD? So how much of the nominal capacity of the battery is usable to us? And that depends on your chemistry. So here I've chosen um, a lithium ion battery and I'm using 80% uh, maximum depth of discharge. Uh, and so I'm dividing that number by 0.8, which is our um, maximum depth of discharge factor. And so I need 15 kilowatt hours. Now you might notice that my days of autonomy here are one, one. Now um, for an off-grid system, that's extremely short. Uh, but for a backup system, say a customer is on grid and they want to run for one day with no power from the grid, then one's correct. Uh, incidentally, the maths don't work if you go below one in this particular formula. So one's the smallest that you can use. Um, but more typically, you would be putting a number in the two to three to five, etc. But that days of autonomy is what it is. I have seen designs by telcos where they have like 15 days of autonomy because they've got no backup, no generator backup. And that transmitter site has to stay up all the time. So you can, you can choose whatever is applicable for your design. Have you done tests on the temperature profile of solar tiles in order to calculate system PV efficiency? Hi, Tosin. Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, I've, I've looked at various solar tiles. In fact, there's um, quite a few manufactured in Australia, um, Tractile, CSR Monia. Um, uh, I think there's another one made in Australia. So people often think Tesla invented them. They've been around for quite a while. Um, the a tile will probably run a bit hotter because of lack of air circulation behind it. But some of those solar tiles use thin film cells. Now thin film, which we covered in episodes uh, two and three, I think, um, uh, thin film solar cells have much lower um, power temperature coefficients than crystalline, so they lose less power as they heat up. So in a way, they, they solve that problem by having a larger area, um, less heat loss, and uh, they're also a roof. Okay, and Richard asks if you've tried, it, tried any hybrid PV and solar thermal, solar thermal modules. Maybe for a future discussion. Is oh, actually, I have Richard. Um, it can be a future discussion right now. So um, sometimes called PVT, photovoltaic thermal. Uh, so I've got um, Solempic panels here. Uh, those they look like your typical flat pa flat hot water panels. Um, so they're large boxy things but the front of them is a PV um, panel. So it's a 200 watt panel with copper pipes behind it. Um, the benefit is uh, area efficiency is very high. So thermal systems can capture a lot more energy than photovoltaic systems, but they only heat water. They don't generate electricity. 
So this system is a 200 watt panel, but it heats a lot of water. So we're capturing probably 60 to 70% of the sun's energy per square meter, which is excellent. So if you've got a site with very constrained space, PVT uh, is, is a solution. I've got them here on a tiny house. There's only room for four panels on the roof of the tiny house. So we've got two PVTs that heats her water and uh, additionally another two just PV panels. So she's got about 800 watts of PV on a tiny house. Glenn asks, what is the biggest safety risk with a large oversizing of a PV array? Right, uh, biggest safety risk. Uh, well, I mean, it's a design solution or a design problem. Like you need to be able to uh, manage voltage, um, uh, manage uh, power. So for instance, if you've got an AC coupled system, then you need to be able to curtail the generation when the batteries are full. Um, uh, in terms of voltage, there are regulatory limits on that. So if it's a residential, it's 600 volts max. If it's commercial, uh, you can go way above that. Large scale often go up to 1500 volts uh, DC. Um, I suppose, uh, you know, mechanical protection of it is an issue. If it's a ground mount system, you know, animals bumping into it, etc. cetera. Um, I don't know, it's a pretty fluffy answer. Okay, Hamish asks, do you think software such as Open Solar or Aurora are accurate? Hamish, look, I, I haven't used either of those, so I can't give you a, um, a comparison. I'm aware of the, those products. So our product, Solar Plus, has been um, around for about seven years now. We are quite a mature product, and uh, we, we started off as a um, joint venture with the Australian Solar Council. Um, we're now um, sole partners, uh, sole, sole, solely owned by um, our team here. And uh, so we've put a lot into our product. Uh, I can't say anything about other products that have just appeared recently. Okay, and Jeremy just said NIWA site gives PSH for any orientation and angle. Oh, that's great, Jeremy. I wasn't aware that NIWA had um, included azimuth and, and inclination as well. So that's really quite useful. And Hamish asks for your thoughts on just assuming three hours of peak power output from PV to calculate daily PV energy output. Numbers are similar to your calculation. Uh, so Hamish, I presume that's kind of a seat of your pants calculation. Look, really, I would use the real numbers. If you've got access, like um, Jeremy was pointing out, from free sites like NIWA, um, use those. Don't just kind of make it up. Uh, three peak hours may not be uh, very true in some locations. You might have cloudy weather uh, throughout winter, so you don't actually get a peak ever. You just get um, low cloud, but over the full length of the day. Fabio um, is very keen to know what you recommend for days, days of autonomy um, and, and how to size for certain days. But he's referring to the example given in the presentation, what should you consider as X days? Well, Fabio, I think I touched on this. It depends on what the purpose of your design is. That particular example with one day of autonomy would be a very poor choice for an off-grid system. Basically, as soon as the weather wasn't ideal, you'd be running a backup generator or, or you'd go, the system would go black, turn off. Um, if it was a backup system for a hybrid, so the customer wanted 10 kilowatt hours of backup for one day, then that would be the right days of autonomy. Do power calculations not go into off-grid inverter and battery sizing? So Anonymous, um, I did at the beginning of today say that we're looking at energy calculations today. We haven't looked at maximum demand. That is, uh, that's the next step. So understanding what the maximum demand is um, by looking at the coincidental loads. Uh, this is a bit more, a bit trickier. Um, it's really hard to predict what coincidental loads will occur. Uh, maybe you've got some measurements that you can use, but to some extent from a design point of view, 4509 says you can state in your design what those coincidental maximum demands are. Uh, and some are um, unavoidable. For instance, if you've got a dishwasher that heats water uh, and you've got a pressure pump, chances are the pump and the dishwasher and the heating of that water will be on at the same time. So they're definitely going to be coincidental loads. But you may specify in design that the arc welder, the dishwasher and the coffee machine can't be run simultaneously. So you can identify what the, max, the, the maximum demand capabilities of your design are. So unless the customer is prepared to spend a large amount by oversizing their inverter's power, just so they don't even have to worry about maximum demand, or you use some smarts, it's possible to use what's called load shedding, which will shed not, um, discretionary loads. For instance, you've got a pool pump, a, a water heater, 
Um, uh, it, even a smart aircon, uh, some of those can be controlled as well. They can be cycled up and down or on and off whenever loads get near the maximum of the inverter power rating. So that's a, another way of dealing with maximum demand. So thanks very much, Rachel. Thank you, everyone. See you tomorrow. And Rachel's on tomorrow. It's her big day. Stop it. <laughs> Well, I hope you enjoyed looking at the basic principles of designing a standalone power system, whether it's off-grid or backup on-grid. Tomorrow, we're going to go into Solar Plus, the software that does this for you. Okay, see you then.